Uh, thank you, Matt, and thank you to the Winton uh, Berry uh, Land Trust. And uh, so, uh, on with the show. Uh, we acknowledge that we are presenting, hosting, and attending an event on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. So there are a lot of kinds of birds in the world, and if you go all the way down to the bottom of this list, uh, you'll find passeriformes, which are this true songbirds, uh, which are also called passerines or perching birds. Doesn't mean that other birds don't sing or, or perch for that matter, but that's what they're called. I'm, I'm not talking about any of the rest of these birds, but uh, songbirds have been so incredibly successful that they outnumber all of the other birds in the world combined, the passeriformes or songbirds. And you'll see them at the top of the list here. Uh, this is a bird family tree. And uh, notice that uh, songbirds and parrots are close cousins and, and falcons right, right there uh, uh, closely related to them as well. So songbirds have uh, three claws in front, one in back. They have 12 tail feathers, six on each side. They, and uh, most wonderfully, they have a syrinx. We have a larynx, which is up in our throat. Their syrinx is uh, to, to make, uh, to sing and hum and speak. Uh, their syrinx, which is how they produce their sounds, is way down uh, right above their lungs. In fact, uh, there are two parts to the syrinx that actually uh, are going to each of those uh, lungs independently, and they can independently control those two branches of the syrinx. You're going to hear a bird actually harmonize with itself later in this program. Uh, and they have the brains to uh, both make these sounds and hear them. Uh, that are far more complex, these songbird brains, than the non-songbird brains in terms of uh, auditory input and vocal output, being able to uh, detect and process all that information. Uh, songbirds' eggs are usually colored, often speckled, but there are exceptions. Think about the robin's egg, which is colored but not speckled. And uh, here we have mom, mother robin caring for her chicks. Uh, songbirds are altricial. That's the opposite of precocial. So uh, these chicks are helpless at birth, but it doesn't take long for them to fledge. Uh, the, most altricial uh, the most altricial animal in the world is us. Humans are helpless for the longest period of time of any animal. Uh, and we can uh, appreciate birds even if we can't see, we can hear them sing. Um, and I wanna give, give a shout out to Lillian and Donald Stokes. They've, they've written 35 different uh, field guides, uh, but uh, really, I, I think their, their main contribution has been in sharing with us what they've learned about bird behavior. You can see that three volume bird behavior uh, series. So if you really want to learn about birds, not just uh, what they are and how to, you know, how, how to distinguish them uh, for ID purposes, but just um, really enter their world. They've, they've, they've spent that time in the field and they've learned a lot. Uh, and I'm going to introduce two other, uh, another husband and wife team, Bill and Judy Guggenheim. The reason I'm featuring this book here is that not only butterflies, which you see on the cover, but also birds often, uh, bluebirds and cardinals are, are two that often are, shall we say, stand-ins for the person who has departed uh, this realm and yet makes uh, appearances for the uh, uh, loved ones who are still uh, here uh, on, on earth uh, that are highly uh, unusual and very deeply moving to those people. So I, I highly recommend this book. Uh, and uh, when I share this slide, uh, sometimes after a program, someone will come up to me and say, yep, I've had an experience like that. And, and in fact, a, a woman said that she'd uh, worked at a shop that, uh, a, a shop that focused on uh, bird items and people would come up to her repeatedly with sharing stories of how, uh, uh, how improbably uh, these appearances uh, would happen and how frequently that would happen to people. So our first bird is the uh, uh, Eastern Wood Peewee. This is one of the uh, primitive songbirds. They're called the, uh, uh, the Tyrant Flycatcher group. And it's uh, Eastern Wood Peewee is gonna say his own name. This is a, uh, so called a sonogram and you'll hear the Peewee say, Peewee. Now notice I did not say, as you can see right here, it sounds, it, it looks like he's saying Peewee. However, this is going by so fast, keep in mind that this, this entire span is a second. And so our ears cannot hear those double, that double peak of, of pitches, nor when he says, we, you, we can't hear anything at all that suggests that the, that the, uh, the pitch uh, climbs dramatically and suddenly, and then just as suddenly drops back down even lower. 
uh, it just goes by in a blur for us, literally. But I can assure you that not only the male who is singing, but the female who is listening can hear those details. Tia, we, ah, did he? We, you. I'll do that again for you. Tia, we, ah, did he? We, you. There we go. Eastern wood peewee. There's the nest. Uh, looks like she's barely fitting in there. Uh, and remember about the eggs being uh, usually colored and often speckled? Well, these are speckled, but they're not colored. And uh, notice also the lichen that helps to camouflage the nest. Uh, Eastern Phoebe, another tyrant flycatcher uh, bird. And uh, this one also says his own name, Phoebe, Phoebe. Fairly simple song compared to other songbirds. Keep in mind now, these, these are the uh, tyrant flycatcher birds, which are uh, less sophisticated than the, um, than the other, uh, I guess you could say true songbirds of the Ossian group. And now we have the largest of these tyrant flycatchers, great crested flycatcher. More often heard than seen. So these are fairly simple songs compared to songbird song, uh, other songbirds. And uh, uh, interesting detail, the tyrant flycatcher chicks do not need to learn the songs from their parents. They actually, uh, if they were to be raised and never heard an adult in their lives, they would still be able to sing their songs just by instinct. That's not true of the other songbirds, uh, the more advanced songbirds who have to learn their songs and practice them. Now, Eastern Kingbird, another one from this, this group of tyrant flycatchers, Tyrannus, Tyrannus is the Latin name. What would possess the or ornithologist who named this bird to call? It's a fairly small bird and it doesn't have, uh, doesn't look that fierce. Just, uh, the beak and the claws are fairly unremarkable, but what he does, and it's uh, all about the male, very strong sense of territoriality. So uh, the airspace right above the female's nest is, is going to be fiercely defended. And if he sees a large bird passing overhead, he will, uh, you know, like, like uh, Superman uh, darting into the phone booth, he's gonna change his output. He's gonna, he's gonna show that crest of red feathers on, his, on, on top of his head, spring into action. He will actually fly above that bird, land on its back and peck on its head mercilessly until that bird is out of his no-fly zone. And the next slide I'm gonna show you is much more miraculous, much more outstanding. It'll take your breath away. There is an Eastern Kingbird on a bald eagle escorting it out of his no-fly zone. Uh, and I, I read once that an Eastern Kingbird was seen to chase a small airplane. Uh, no doubt the kingbird thought he was successful because the airplane kept going and was, due to, uh, was, was suitably uh, intimidated. All right, now here's a, another uh, 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 a bird that uh, is quite, uh, well, uh, suffice it to say that the name butcher bird for Northern Shrike has been earned because what the, what the Shrike, he, the Shrike is, is perfectly capable of hunting not only insects, which so many birds do, but also uh, Oh, snakes, uh, small mammals such as shrews, voles, moles, and mice, and other birds as well are victims of the shrike. And the shrike will then take the corpse and uh, just uh, place it on a barbed wire fence or on a thorn or something and then go hunt some more. So after a while, there might be two or three corpses in a row. That's why he's called the butcher bird. You will not see the northern shrike in the summer, only in, uh, in New England, only during the winter. Uh, so. Uh, in the, in the summer, he's, he's summering up, they are summering up north. Uh, Red-eyed vireo now uh, uh, is uh, also sometimes called the preacher bird. Uh, he just doesn't know when to shut up. Uh, 20 some thousand songs were counted by a patient ornithologist in the course of one day uh, from a single male red-eyed vireo uh, who seems to be saying, here am I, where are you? Here am I, where are you? Over and over again. So perhaps you recognize this song because if you've spent time in the woods, there's a good chance you have heard this uh, red-eyed video going on and on and on. The warbling vireo is another uh, member of this uh, uh, closely related uh, to the red-eyed. And then we have the blue jay. Uh, now, jays and crows are in the same family, the corvidae family. 
So if you think about uh, jays, you'll realize they really are a lot like crows. They, for one thing, the male and female uh, uh, are indistinguishable to our eyes. Uh, so um, they're about the same size, about the same shape. Uh, and they're also quite vocal, and their uh, repertoire of vocalizations is really pretty impressive. Um, so let's, this is a small sample here. And it sounds a little bit like a, a crow. So, and there are the uh, mom and dad, not only does the father help, but uh, the, uh, the older siblings of these chicks um, uh, might have fledged, uh, you know, earlier in the year, but they, they're uh, perfectly capable of uh, helping mom and dad uh, feed and protect those chicks. Uh, so blue jays are uh, unquestionably quite intelligent. Uh, they, I'm sure all those vocalizations mean something and that that was just uh, uh, a, a small sample of what they're capable of saying. So I think of these uh, vocalizations as, as more communication rather than songs per se. Uh, and then we have the American crow itself. Uh, let's uh, hear a sample of what crows say. <laughs> Incidentally, I encourage you to, uh, if you really want to hear some uh, um, in-depth uh, recordings that are that are much longer than these, Andrew Lang, uh, L-A-N-G, Andrew Lang, uh, just uh, check out check him out on uh, online. He's done a lot of uh, recording of bird songs, and they're, they're really quite astounding. So uh, American crows are uh, the uh, uh, are famed for their intelligence. It used to be thought that only humans could make and invent and use tools, but uh, that's not the case. And when uh, the crows are definitely able to do that, uh, they will invent a tool that's suitable for the occasion that, and they'll solve a, a problem that they've never been confronted with before. They also have incredible memories. Uh, and if, if they uh, are uh, regard a human as suspicious, they, they will not only remember that human as being suspicious for the rest of their lives regarding regardless of what they're wearing, but they will teach their chicks not to trust that human either. Uh, the list goes on and on. And crows are quite uh, playful, mischievous. They, uh, they hoard shiny objects. Uh, they, uh, uh, they like to uh, slide down slippery steeples or, the, or a, a snowbank or the like. Uh, and then um, we have the common raven, the, the largest of the songbirds. And uh, I'll, I'll point out the silhouette here. That is what a, a raven looks like. Uh, look at the tail and you'll see, uh, in contrast to the American crow, it has a different shape. Uh, another way you can tell a, a raven in flight from a crow is that it will soar much, uh, it can soar much longer like a hawk does. Uh, crows just can't do that. And if you have binoculars or if you see it up close, look at that head, a, a massive, uh, you know, bumpy head with a massive beak and a scruffy beard. That's the raven. And just like the other uh, jays and crows, an impressive vocabulary. And a raven sounds like a crow with a sore throat. Uh, incredibly, a raven has been seen, or more than one, on more than one occasion, ravens have been seen to fly upside down for as far as a half mile. What's remarkable about that is not only that the fact that they can do such a thing, but that, that they, would, they would even attempt it. Uh, it it's an indicator of just how playful uh, these birds are, and uh, they like a challenge. Uh, and they like tall places. That's you, you're not likely to find ravens unless they're unless the topography uh, is right for them. 
Now the purple martin is the largest of our swallows. Oh, that's, uh, that's another uh, of the ravens vocalization. Ah, oh, yes. And, and still we've only scratched the surface of the, uh, the raven's vocabulary. Now here's the purple martin. And these are the accommodations that purple martins like. People have been attracting purple martins for centuries. Native Americans uh, would offer them hollowed out gourds because, uh, well, they eat insects or uh, pesky, uh, including in, uh, mosquitoes. Now we're listening to, uh, actually, this is the tree swallow, but uh, and the could swallow, the barn swallow. And there are several uh, swallows here. Let's see, this is uh, about our black cat chickadee. Yes. Hey, sweetie. You know, this is the uh, song. Hey, sweetie. Hey, sweetie. That's the sonogram of the typical black cat chickadee song. Now we're listening to the scolding or alarm call, a uh, tickety dee 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 dee. And now you're going to hear uh, only on Martha's Vineyard, sweetie, hey, sweetie, hey. You can see it's different from the hey, sweetie of the, uh, the typical black cap chickadee. This is not all that unusual for birds to have dialects and to sing uh, songs in slightly different ways in different places. And yes, you can get black cap chickadees to come to your hand. In fact, uh, there's a Ipswich Sanctuary, which is just north of Boston, North Shore of Boston, uh, owned by the Audubon Society, and those birds uh, will trust you because, well, after, after all, you're at the Audubon Sanctuary. You must be trustworthy, and they'll come right to your hands without any uh, taming on your part. But you can do this, too, on, in, your own, uh, uh, in your own neighborhood. They'll come to you. Tufted titmouse is related to the black-capped chickadee. And some people think he's saying, Peter, 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 Peter. But he says a lot of other things too. Notice the rusty color underneath the wings. And there's a scolding sound that sounds a lot like a black cat chickadee. Red bristle nuthatch. This is a small bird, but he's got a loud song, like a toy horn. What, 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 what? <laughs> That's it. That now is the white breasted nuthatch. Uh, and so, People sometimes think of the white-breasted nuthatch as the upside-down bird because that's uh, often the uh, position that you'll see this bird in, going down a trunk, um, looking for uh, edible things uh, that might be hiding in the bark that wouldn't be visible otherwise. And the brown creeper has the, exactly the opposite strategy. It will start at the base of the tree and spiral around going up the tree, looking underneath the bark to see what it can find to eat. Uh, brown creeper is much less uh, common than white-breasted nuthatch. Yeah. Uh, so this is the brown creeper. High-pitched song. Fairly small bird with a curved beak. Carolina wren. These uh, the wrens are small birds. They're uh, easily identified with the way they. Uh, their tails stick straight up like that. And uh, they too are, are uh, even though they're small in stature, they have a loud uh, song uh, and have the temperament to, to match. Listen to the Carolina Wren saying, uh, kettle, 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 kettle. House wren. And before I play the recording of the winter wren, 
I'm going to show it to you. Here is the sonogram concert of the male winter wren. Remarkable. Keep in mind now, this is all in the course of one second. And this is a long song, too. So, songbirds don't usually sing for seven seconds and interruption like this. But, uh, and notice how, uh, now right here, going back and forth, back and forth, right, right before the two second mark. Uh, and again, uh, down right before the seven second mark. You can see uh, what must be uh, the two sides of the syrinx, you know, the, uh, each one, uh, you know, one side for each lung. It mu they must be um, responding to each other in, uh, in inc with incredible accuracy, just back and forth, call and response, uh, uh, back and forth like that. And, and then the next uh, interval, that, which starts at around the two second mark and goes past the three second mark, it looks fairly random until you come and uh, begin uh, at about uh, almost five and a half seconds, uh, th exactly the same contour, you know, so it's, um, he's, he's repeating himself pretty much word for word or sound for sound what he had just already said uh, back three seconds ago. Here is the, the, uh, the, sound, the song now of this maestro, this in incredibly talented singer. Let's, let's start from the beginning and hear that again. Oh, no, that's the other one. This is, this is the winter right now. All right, let's repeat. I wish I could find a recording of this slowed down at one, about one tenth speed, but uh, I have to be satisfied with, uh, with, with that. So golden crown kinglet, a very small bird, much smaller than a black capped chickadee. High pitched song. Regulus Satrapa. Followed by the Ruby Crown Kinglet. Beautiful song. And the Eastern Bluebird, everyone's favorite, and actually seemed to be on the verge of extinction to habitat loss about a century ago, and they've made a remarkable comeback uh, due in large part to uh, human efforts to uh, make sure that habitat was provided for them. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, bluebird boxes and the like, and bluebirds require open uh, meadows. Uh, they, they are not birds of the forest. So if you have that kind of habitat, then bluebirds can show up. So uh, this is the male on the right, and on the lower right hand corner, you'll see the male in his breeding plumage in the spring. In the fall, uh, he does, doesn't quite look quite as showy as he did in earlier th that year. Now, here is a recording of uh, Bluebird. You can recognize this song. If you listen to it, I think, I think of him saying, look at here, I'm Bluebird. Look at here, I'm Bluebird. But of course, when you hear a Bluebird the next time, he may not be saying exactly what you just heard. But you, you kind of key in on the, the quality of the sound. Bluebird. <laughs> okay, that's the Eastern Bluebird. And uh, you can learn uh, about any, any book, you, any bird you choose by going to allaboutbirds.org, which is the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology website, and they will give you cool facts about the bird in question. Here, is, uh, here are some facts to share about Eastern Bluebirds. The male will display at the nest cavity to attract the female. The female then builds the nests and incubates the eggs. Usually they have more than one brood per year. And the young from later nests often stay with the parents over the winter. And suddenly this is just like the uh, blue jays, the uh, older bluebird siblings will uh, help to raise the, the younger chicks. Uh, diet includes insects and fruits, but also shrews, salamanders, snakes, lizards, and tree frogs. Who would have thought that this cute little bird, bird the Eastern bluebird would be such a formidable, formidable uh, carnivore. But when the opportunity strikes, 
the bluebird will strike. Uh, now there's the Eastern bluebird egg compared to the egg of a robin uh, and compared to other uh, common uh, songbird eggs. Not much larger than a dime uh, and a clutch of five or so eggs and then they They, uh, in a remarkably short period of time, just a little over a couple of weeks, they're fledging. Uh, and these are not chicks. These are adult bluebirds. They are, uh, uh, they are keeping each other warm, basically, uh, and they're roosting inside a hollow cavity. And uh, you can provide a roost for uh, birds uh, during the winter, and you can either make one yourself or buy it on the internet um, and order one. And uh, birds, I'm sure, will appreciate the chance to get in out of the cold and keep each other warm. Now, uh, incidentally, the, the bluebird is a thrush, and so is the veery. Bluebird does not look or sound like a thrush, but it is. Uh, the veery It's like a cascade of notes descending. That's the veery. Now the hermit thrush always starts with a clear whistled note. Like that. It's so magical to hear thrushes. Uh, dusk is the typical time to hear them in their woodland song. Now, uh, I promise you, uh, I promised you that I was going to play a recording of a bird harmonizing with itself, and this is the one, the wood thrush, uh, and there is the sonogram, uh, and I'll show you uh, a detail of that sonogram. In fact, there are three different sounds being made simultaneously, three different pitches, because this top row here is the harmonic of the lower, of the lower voice, and uh, I don't have time to explain about harmonics uh, and, and uh, how when you hear actually one pitch, it might be two or more. But uh, suffice it to say that this, this is all being produced by one bird. And the recording I'm about to play for you, uh, it's been, um, the two sounds have been separated. So you will hear first, uh, and it's one tenth speed. You'll hear it at uh, much slower than, uh, because you wouldn't be able to hear the detail unless it was slowed down. So of course you'll hear a lower pitch, much lower pitch than, than, in, uh, than in real life. You'll hear one side of the syrinx, then you hear the other side of the syrinx, and then the two together. Now together. That is remarkable. Uh, but of course, again, that was one tenth speed, and this is normal speed. So our ears simply cannot hear the harmony being produced, but you just heard the evidence that, that it is in fact happening. Well, who would have thought that the pedestrian American Robin that we see so often is also a thrush. And its song is not nearly as enchanting as the other thrushes we've heard, but a thrush it is nevertheless. Uh, the, uh, the male is, has the darker color, uh, darker coloration. And uh, so uh, on we go to the gray catbird, which is one of the mimidae, uh, the family mimidae, the mimicking birds. And the catbird has a lot to notice, by the way, that the catbird is in this photo is actually eating flower buds. Uh, who would have thought, right? That birds could eat flowers and flower buds, but they do. It's part of the menu. And catbirds just go on and on and on. They're, I think, endlessly inventive as well as being a uh, good uh, mimics. Catbirds are quite bold. Uh, they will come right up to you quite close and not uh, not be shy at all. Being a bullfrog in the base in the background. Mm. 
well, you there's a there's a taste of the cat bird. He goes on, right? <laughs> doesn't, doesn't, no reason to stop. Uh, now here is the signature cat sound. Meow <laughs> says the great cat bird. <laughs> cat birds hang out in, in shrub, shrubs often. Shrubs are a good habitat for cat birds. Now the northern mockingbird. Also one of the mimidae, but notice how the mockingbird repeats himself several times and then pauses and then says something new and then pause several times and then pauses again. So each phrase is repeated at least, well, three in a row any, at any rate, sometimes longer. So mockingbirds really are good at mocking, and sometimes you'll hear mockingbirds uh, repeat sounds that they've heard not only of other birds, but uh, human-produced uh, sounds, such as an alarm clock or a car alarm or, or someone whistling. So the, uh, the mockingbird is a consummate improviser. And uh, now uh, I'm going to share my own story. I mentioned earlier about uh, how often cardinals and bluebirds show up uh, almost as a stand-in, seemingly, for uh, someone who's recently deceased. Uh, and um, I had a, a, a very memorable experience of going to visit a musician whom, uh, who really was my mentor when I was a jazz musician down in, uh, in the Triangle uh, area of uh, Durham, Raleigh, and Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Uh, and um, I had the pleasure of uh, playing with him. He was a piano player, a composer, leader of a sextet, uh, and uh, when I was living there. But then uh, a number of years later, I heard that he was not long for this world. He was living in a, a nursing home and I decided I wanted to go see him one last time. So I did go and uh, I, uh, I'm able to uh, uh, lead someone into trance and I call it a mind massage. So I, I gave him a very relaxing experience of trance uh, in addition as part of my visit with him. And then I uh, left the nursing home and uh, knew that I would not see him again. So uh, his name is Brother Yusuf. Uh, he called everyone brother or sister the first time he meets you. He's gonna, he, he considers you to be family. So, uh, so I, I got in my car, closed the car door, and a mockingbird came immediately and perched on my side view mirror just inches away from my face. It did not sing, but it didn't need to. It was letting me know in some way, and I believe that uh, uh, Brother Yusuf was somehow responsible for this, even though he hadn't passed himself. Uh, he was still on this, uh, uh, you know, he, he was still back in the nursing home, he hadn't passed yet. But uh, I believe that, uh, that perhaps he drifted off into sleep and that his soul, shall we say, had directed the mockingbird to visit me. And I can assure you that this will never happen again, <laughs> that a mockingbird will come and perch on my side view mirror and, and keep me company for uh, several minutes. So on with the show, the brown thrasher, which is also in the mimic, uh, Mimidae family and repeats himself, but only once. So you'll hear uh, phrases in two. The last two times I saw a brown thrasher uh, were down in Virginia. They're not that, they don't seem to be that common here in New, in New England. So everything is in pairs with the brown thrasher. It's called a thrasher because he thrashes around in the in the duff looking for something to eat. Now the European starling happens to be uh, a non-native uh, alien bird. Doesn't belong here, really. Uh, it was brought over here uh, from Europe and. Uh, it has really taken over and in, 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 uh, often is quite aggressive, uh, will, will kill uh, and, and displace other birds. So uh, starling is not protected uh, by the state and uh, you are free to trap or harass starlings if you choose. Uh, they are amazing in terms of their vocal ability uh, and it's called a murmuration when you see a cloud of uh, birds and, and starlings often do this. You'll see just a, a large flock moving together, you know, uh, darting this way and that way, as if the, the, that flock had uh, shared a single mind. 
so they, they really are remarkable. And yet uh, they are having a, quite a negative impact on our populations of our wild uh, songbirds, our native birds. So this is what a European starling sounds like, or maybe a group of them. And the, I would say that the sounds are not all that musical to our ears. In fact, they're kind of creepy in some ways to me. Well, I'm gonna move on to the cedar waxwing, one of my favorite birds, a high pitched song. They're a fairly small bird and they will descend in large, they also are often seen in flocks. A flock will descend on a tree and just strip it bare of fruit uh, in, in a matter of minutes and then move on. Uh, they also, they also, they're quite sociable. They'll, they'll flock together, nest together. Uh, and here uh, is the Bohemian waxwing. Notice uh, the photography of Joe Oliverio. Um, he, he also lives in Amherst, Massachusetts, as, as do I. In fact, he, uh, he and I used to live on the same block. And then uh, uh, he became two things. He became a photographer and a birder, and he excels at both. So I encourage you to visit his website if you'd like to see uh, some astounding uh, nature photography, Joe Oliverio. Uh, Bohemian Waxwing, there it is. Uh, and all of these are Joe's uh, work. He, he, cap he captures birds in some really interesting postures. We don't see Bohemian Waxwings that often here in Massachusetts, they're more common farther north. Now, warblers, there are a lot of them out there. Uh, here is a partial list of New England warblers. And uh, you can go to ebird.org to find out which migrants are arriving where or when, because you'll see them in the spring and fall. Uh, and also BirdCast, uh, you can check them out uh, for real-time bird forecasts that track the waves of migrants moving north. Um, now, chestnut-sided warbler, I'm not gonna, show you all of them or play recordings for all of them, but here's a representative sampling. Please, please, please to meet you, says chestnut-sided warbler. Sweet, 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 I'm so sweet, yellow warbler. Sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. And the black and white warbler sounds like a squeaky wheel. Beasy, 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 beasy. Really striking bird, unusual markings. Common yellow throat. Wichity, 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 says the common yellow throat. The male, of course, is the one that's singing, the one with the black mask. It's almost always the male that sings. He's doing it uh, for one of two reasons, typically either to attract the female or to intimidate other males and letting them know that this is my territory. Uh, keep out. And that's the oven bird you're hearing saying, churty, 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 chur. Doesn't look like a th uh, warbler, but it is. Looks more like a thrush. It's called the oven bird because it makes uh, a, a nest on the forest floor that reminds you of a Dutch oven. Uh, there's an oven bird up close. Uh, Bay-breasted warbler is also uh, to be seen here in New England. So is the black-throated blue, the black-throated green, the black pole, the blue-winged, the Northern Parallel, what a beautiful bird that is. Pine Warbler, Blackburnian, striking uh, markings on the face. The Cape May Warbler. American Red Star is also a warbler. And again, the, the difference between male and female is striking. And speaking of the difference between male and female, my goodness, who would have known that that female on the right is related to that male scarlet tanager, but she's all about camouflage. She doesn't need to or want to be seen, whereas the scarlet tanager is all about being uh, uh, quite, quite visible and striking. So if you hear a song that sounds like a robin with a sore throat, remember how the raven is like a crow with a sore throat? Well, tan scarlet tanager is like a robin with a sore throat. Oh, let's see. Here it is. So a robin sounds like cheerly, cheerio, cheerly, cheerio. 
but a scarlet tanager has a rough edge to that same, but it's the same kind of cadence, that same inter interrupted. You know, that singing short phrases with pauses in between. And the rufous sided toey uh, is perhaps one of the most humorous. Uh, this is, uh, he, people think he's saying, drink your tea. <laughs> Again, it's the male, which you see pictured here. And as you can see by the sonograms, not every male toe all over this entire range will sound the same. But just the shape of those markings on the sonogram is really pretty impressive when you think of, when you realize that what you're looking at is over the course of time, those pitches are happening simultaneous. Uh, uh, they, and sometimes there's a band of pitches that's being produced simultaneously. Song sparrow, one of my favorite birds, uh, a true uh, sound of spring and summer, um, and Melospisa melodia, an apt scientific name. And here is the sonogram of a song sparrow singing, uh, well, some birds just say, they hear, maids, 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 please put the tea kettle on. But every time you hear a male uh, song sparrow sing, he's going to sing it a little bit differently. So you heard that please, that kind of... Uh, there's that, please put the tea kettle on. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. White-throated sparrow. Yellow marking right above the eye. And he is saying, oh, Sam, peabody, peabody, peabody. Oh, Sam, peabody, peabody. But if you're Canadian, you're quite sure that the white-throated sparrow is indeed singing Oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. Let's hear that again. So we, we have the, uh, let's see. There's also the fox sparrow and the house sparrow. House sparrow is another non-native bird in Sunley that uh, just does not belong here and has done a lot of damage and is also not protected by the state. Again, you are free to trap or harass house sparrows if you choose to. Uh, they 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 displace our native birds. They do a lot of damage to native populations. Um, Dark-eyed junco is another uh, familiar bird seen at, uh, um, they are ground feeders uh, during the winter. You'll see them underneath the feeder, helping themselves to the seed that's dropped on the ground. And now the Northern Cardinal, one of my favorites. Uh, what a, a talented singer the, this, these birds are. And by the way, females are sometimes heard to sing as well. Their songs are slightly different, and sometimes the two will overlap, so they'll be uh, duetting, the male and the female, but usually it's the male that you'll hear. That is the Rose-Breasted Grosbeaks concert. And uh, just as the Scarlet Tanager sounds like a, a robin on it with a sore throat, 
a rose-breasted grosbeak is more like a robin that has taken singing lessons. You'll see just, you'll, you'll hear just how clear and crisp the, uh, the, uh, the notes are that the rose-breasted grosbeak is singing much different uh, than what you would hear from, and much uh, louder than what you'd hear from a robin. And another dramatic uh, illustration of just how different males and females can be. Again, the female is all about camouflage for protection. And uh, evening grows speak. I don't have a recording of this bird, but uh, they're much less common than they used to be, incidentally. Uh, and another Joe Oliverio composition of the uh, evening grow speak. Now the indigo bunting, what a beautiful bird this one is. Uh, let's see, I think. Yeah. And now the bobolink. Oh, wait a minute. All right, look, I have the wrong one. That was the house sparrow you heard. Um, here we go. This is the indigo, uh, this is the uh, bobolink, excuse me. He looks like he's wearing a tuxedo backward, doesn't he? And these, these are birds of the meadows and uh, it's important uh, if you manage a meadow to, to not mow it at the wrong time because the nests will be destroyed uh, if, if you're mowing during the time of nesting. Uh, Red-winged blackbird has been called the, the most uh, common bird of North America. There are more red-winged blackbirds than any other songbird. Uh, they, uh, they favor wetlands. So here we have unmistakable. The modeling for you. This too would be interesting to hear at a slower pace. A slower speed recording. Uh, now, the, oh, this is the red wing blackbird. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I had the uh, wrong recording. A very, uh, very grating sound the red wing blackbird makes. And here we have Eastern Meadowlark saying, Spring of the Earth. Another bird of the meadows. And these uh, meadowland birds have been having a really uh, difficult time with their population numbers. Oh, the common grackle. Sometimes you'll see large flocks of these. So they'll just descend uh, uh, in the backyard or uh, for no apparent reason and, and leave just as abruptly. Grackles seem to like uh, to hang around water. Now the brown headed cowbird, it sounds like a pebble being dropped in water, doesn't it? Let's listen to that again. That's the male brown headed cowbird on the left. Uh, now, this is a case of brood parasitism. The female cowbird does not know how to build a nest uh, or tend for her own young. She simply lays her one large egg in the nest of a different kind of bird and then flies away never to see that egg again or the chick. So what happens is that that egg will hatch and, uh, and will manage to evict the other eggs that are its nestmates uh, and uh, then the female uh, that the nest belongs to, the female bird of whatever species, uh, if all goes well according to the uh, cowbird's uh, future success, 
um, will will raise that bird as if it's its own. Here is a case of uh, where this chipping sparrow on the left is feeding a cowbird chick uh, twice its own size because she is convinced, well, it must be mine because it came from my nest. Uh, she's doing her duty. Uh, other birds, however, are not so easily fooled. In some cases, uh, birds that are aware that this uh, egg is an imposter will actually try to evict it. And if they can't, they will build a new nest on top of the old. They will refuse to incubate that egg. Baltimore Oriole, another exquisite bird, uh, both uh, beautiful to, to look at and uh, to watch in flight, uh, just gorgeous colors, but also the song. Is, uh, is quite the musical. Notice this uh, photo in the upper, uh, upper middle uh, eating, eating flower buds just as the catbird was doing. Notice this unusual nest that the Oriole female is able to construct. Uh, it's a pendant nest that does, it, it seems to defy gravity. How in the world uh, could it be strong enough to just you know, last through showers and wind and, uh, but she, she knows what she's doing and, and is able to raise, raise her brood of chicks. And an orchard or oriole, somewhat different coloration and patterns. Um, and then there are the finches, the purple finch. Uh, which, I think it should be called a red finch, but there's no accounting for these names sometimes. A house finch. Seems like he's dipped his head in red paint, the male. And then we have a common red pole, the pine siskin, and last but not least, the American goldfinch, who uh, seems to be saying potato chip at, as uh, part of his repertoire. You hear the potato chip. You'll see goldfinches dip and soar and dip and soar in flight and they're singing all the while. And they love to eat the thistle seed and they, in fact, they time their nesting to coincide with uh, when those when that thistle seed will be available. So uh, bird populations have declined dramatically uh, in the last half century and will continue to do so unless we do a lot of things very differently. Uh, so climate change is a big part of the problem, but not the only problem. The other uh, part is habitat uh, because they just don't have enough wild places uh, to sustain them anymore. Uh, so Rachel Carson sounded the alarm way back uh, uh, about 60 years ago with this, in this book, Silent Spring, about the uncontrolled use of dangerous toxic uh, pesticides uh, that were killing birds and other wildlife. And they still do. Uh, uh, agricultural pesticides do uh, account for a lot of these bird fat fatalities. Neonicotinoids in particular, they're, they're, they're called neonics for short, are, are, are systemic pet, uh, Pesticides, they just do not belong on our shelves and they don't belong in farmers' fields. They are, uh, they are having devastating impacts uh, on wildlife and uh, birds and insects alike. Um, window collisions also kill a lot of birds because birds see, especially these large picture windows that reflect the outdoors perfectly. Uh, they, it seems like outdoors to them and they, they try to fly there and it's, uh, learn too late that it's not. Uh, so we can actually make our windows more visible to birds. I invite you to go to abcbirds.org to learn more, American Bird Conservancy. And it's just not uh, um, sustainable, shall we say, to allow cats to be outdoors because they account for so many bird fatalities. Uh, and birds themselves are at risk uh, for a number of wild animals that can harm them, or for that matter, uh, excuse me, cats themselves are at risk. Uh, if, if cats are allowed to be out, so outdoors, they can be uh, harmed by other cats and dogs that are on the loose or a number of uh, uh, wild animals. 
Um, so they should be kept indoors for their own sa uh, safety as well as for the sake of uh, the birds that they are preying on. And you're welcome to feed birds, but please do so mindfully because uh, most baked goods are, are not healthy for birds. Uh, if they're heavily processed, if they, if they contain salt, sugar, refined flour, uh, and in most cases, they have very little that's actually food for the, as, as far as the bird is concerned. La they lack protein and lack fat, but uh, you know, they're, they're tempted to eat it because, uh, well, it just, just for the same reasons that people are tempted to eat empty calories. But for a bird, it could mean uh, that they, this, this bird will never fly again. It's eaten so much of that, uh, what really is junk food or empty calories. So here are some things that are okay to feed birds, eggshells, uh, uh, bananas, apples, raisins, a hard, uh, hard cheese, peas, corn, uh, oats, squ squash seeds, peanuts. Uh, and uh, you can make your own home bird, homemade uh, burnt feeder. Uh, you know, do-it-yourself options are, uh, are legion uh, on the internet. You have a lot of different approaches you can take. Uh, I, I, uh, I suggest that if you have an open feeder like this one, you're gonna need to clean it quite often because of course birds will foul that platform. Uh, so perhaps a closed feeder is better. Uh, and or like this one and um, in most cases people want to keep squirrels out so here are some strategies some squirrel baffles for doing just that um, and uh, perhaps the window feeder is one of the best designs out there because uh, not only do we get to see them up close so it's a thrilling experience uh, but uh, predators and, uh, and squirrels are unlikely to be able to access that feeder and you'll also be reminded uh, since you'll see that feeder so often, uh, you'll look at it, you'll monitor it, you'll, you'll realize if it needs to be uh, cleaned. Uh, and uh, so suet uh, is an option. Uh, you can just buy suet um, at the meat department of your grocery store or else uh, use shortening and heat it with peanut butter if you like, add the cornmeal, but shortening and cornmeal are really the only two ingredients you would need. But uh, you mix all those ingredients and uh, after heating the first two, uh, and then freeze them in uh, molds such as ice cube trays or uh, an old uh, tuna fish can or something. Uh, and then after two hours, that's ready to put in your suet feeder. Uh, suet should not be offered above 50 degrees because it turns rancid. You can offer water feeders to birds and bird baths as well. And you don't need to spend a lot of money necessarily. You could even perhaps find things around your house that are, are ready made for the purpose, like, like an uh, an upside down uh, garbage can lid would do just fine as far as a bird is concerned. Uh, you can buy a fairly, for fairly uh, inexpensive, uh, one of these heating elements to keep the water uh, liquid in the, uh, and uh, melted in the winter so that birds can enjoy it and uh, get a drink and, uh, dr and clean themselves as well. So bird boxes, if you make them, you should be mindful of the fact that different birds need different kinds of boxes. So ask yourself which kinds of bird you would like to attract and uh, this uh, website, allbirds.com, will give you explicit instructions, uh, box floor, box height, entrance height, entrance diameter, uh, are different for the different birds. Here is your basic bird box, and you'll see that uh, there are hinges on one side so that you'll be able to open that uh, bird box and inspect it and clean it at the end, of the end of the season. Notice also that there are three holes at the top of, of that side, uh, uh, of each side for ventilation. And also notice there are holes at, on the bottom, on the base uh, for uh, drainage. And a metal pole is a good approach uh, for, a, for mounting a bird box uh, because it's hard for predators to climb the metal pole. Uh, if you pl uh, place it in the shade with a clear flight path for the birds and uh, face it away from the prevailing wind, those are all, are all advantageous for the birds. Uh, so uh, now here's a, a Peterson bluebird box. Uh, that uh, no, notice the uh, 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 flashing, the, the piece of metal on top, which protects the wood from rotting. If that was not there, this uh, pine box would, uh, would be uh, rotting just within a few years, but uh, the protection really makes it, uh, gives it a, a lifetime guarantee. Uh, notice also that, again, it's possible to open that box as it's, as it's shown here. It's, it's placed on the floor, on the ground just for a, uh, uh, to take a picture of it, but uh, it certainly would not be left on the ground for the for the bluebirds. But uh, uh, now, uh, ag again, I mentioned that starlings and house sparrows are uh, non-native birds and are not protected. 
uh, nestwatch.org will perhaps give you some ideas about how to manage uh, your house sparrow and your European starling infestations if you have them. Uh, and if you off, if you have birdhouses, please do not uh, put up uh, birdhouses with, with bright colors that attracts the attention of predators. Also, perches are totally unnecessary for birds. They, uh, they can enter the house quite easily without the perch, but the perch actually gives uh, the predator uh, uh, it makes it a little bit easier for them to access it. Um, and uh, birdhouses should be made totally of wood and should not be dangling from a string. They should be securely fastened to something. Now, uh, squirrels are ca perfectly capable of enlarging, if they can get at it, uh, enlarging the hole of a bird box to let themselves in. And you can prevent them from doing that by uh, fastening uh, that uh, square piece of uh, hardware with a circle in the middle. Uh, and you would want to protect uh, birdhouses, especially if you fasten it to a side of a tree. It's quite vulnerable to predation unless you uh, make sure that there is some way to prevent access. Uh, so I, I want to encourage you to landscape for birds and, and other beneficial wildlife, as, especially pollinators need a lot of help as well. Uh, and uh, one of the first things you'll need to do uh, in your landscaping plans is be aware of invasive plants. Uh, MassLive.com uh, will uh, has a great article, uh, 31 plants that could be growing into a jungle in your backyard. So the, the 31 most common uh, culprits, the, the invasive plants that uh, you just don't want to give them any chance. Uh, you give them an inch, they take a mile. Um, and this article would inform you about different ways to uh, control them. Uh, It's not even legal to sell burning bush uh, um, at nurseries anymore. Poison ivy, incidentally, is not an alien. It, it's a native vine and it belongs here in our woods. As a matter of fact, birds eat those fruits in the winter. Uh, but I totally understand if you want to uh, make sure that there's no poison ivy uh, near where people would be uh, using the out, out of doors. So in order, if you have an infestation of poison ivy or if you have an infestation of lawn, which so many of us do, and you want to uh, transition to vegetation that's more wildlife friendly, the first step you might want to take is just smother rather than, rather than digging up that unwanted vegetation. It's, it can be much easier and more effective to use either flattened uh, and wetted cardboard boxes uh, overlapping. Uh, of course, no tape and no staples should be uh, left attached. Uh, you can use newspaper too, but you'd, you would need six thicknesses of newspaper. And then you would cover that. Uh, if you're starting a garden for vegetables, you'll probably want some something to enrich the soil like uh, compost. But if you're planting native vegetation, you just need the, the a barrier layer and then mulch on top of that. Notice in the lower right hand corner, you'll see something called builder's paper, uh, which is sold to uh, painters when they're um, uh, if they're painting the, the apartment, they, they don't want to uh, get paint all over the place, so they'll just lay this down on the floor. But you can use the same product uh, for sheet mulching of a large area. Or you could start much smaller uh, and do things gradually. Uh, but regardless, uh, it's a great technique uh, for uh, repurposing part of your uh, landscape for uh, nature, uh, natural landscaping. Uh, so for annual beds, such as the vegetable gardens, uh, grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, and pine straw, which is the same as pine needles, are fine for mulching. Incidentally, pine straw does not make the soil acidic. That's an old myth that's been disproven. For perennial beds, you can use shredded leaves and pine straw on them as well, but keep in mind that they are not going to last as long as pine bark and wood chips and chip branch wood would last. Uh, but the eventual goal is that uh, the plants themselves will be so successful that you won't need mulch anymore. After all, mulch, the purpose of mulch is just to protect uh, the soil, uh, keep it moist and cool, and keep the weeds out. Uh, but once the plants have uh, established themselves well, uh, they will be doing that job uh, without any need for further mulching. So, but don't overuse mulch. Don't uh, make mounds uh, around trees, for example, because the, then the roots will grow way up where they shouldn't be and then they will become exposed when that mulch is, um, is weathered and, and uh, or settles. Uh, and so there you have an example of where uh, it was, this, this area was probably mulched originally, but it no longer needs to be because the plants are commanding that space. This happens to be a, a, a rain garden. So the, 
the garden is receiving water from the roof and it's, it's watering the plants every time it rains and then uh, look how successful and happy those plants are. Uh, now, Doug Tallamy is an important uh, crusader and author uh, and he has a very important message that we need to be planting native plants, not non-natives. So often people think that the most beautiful plants are somehow the ones that are exotic from foreign lands. And it's just not the case because we have uh, just gorgeous native vegetation, uh, trees, shrubs, uh, wildflowers. Uh, but uh, if you're planting non-natives, well, uh, caterpillars just can't eat that vegetation. Caterpillars need our, their own uh, you know, native uh, plants, especially trees and shrubs. Um, because uh, black-capped chickadees, for example, need to, need 6,000 to 9,000 of those caterpillars to raise their brood. This is ideal baby food for, for those chicks. It's uh, soft and has all the right nutrients for them. Now, where is that chickadee gonna find all those caterpillars? They certainly won't find them on non-native vegetation. So uh, it's all about uh, the, the uh, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, all about birds.org, uh, uh, offers the following plants. Uh, as a starter list, oaks are great as uh, host plants for caterpillars. Mulberry fruits are irresistible to birds. So are elderberry shrubs. Uh, here's, a, here's an ornithomental, if there ever was one, an ornamental for birds. Uh, all of the viburnums are just gorgeous in the different seasons. Gray dogwood, red osier dogwood, four season interest. Uh, white dogwood, and uh, you can get 10 of these at arborday.org by giving them, a, 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 or 10 other trees. Uh, if, if you go to their website, you'll see all the choices. Uh, if you give them a donation of any amount you choose, they will send you 10 free trees. Uh, spice bush, a beautiful shrub, and that fruit is very nutritious, 50% uh, fat, uh, great energy for birds. Staghorn sumac fruits are available in early winter. Uh, and uh, what bird wouldn't eagerly eat uh, blueberries? Uh, winterberry hollies, again, through all through the winter are available for birds and are great uh, pollinator plants as well. Uh, Juneberry, a, a be just a beautiful uh, small tree for the landscape. And uh, those fruits are delicious uh, for humans and birds. But birds usually get most of them because uh, they're on the lookout for them and they can reach them a lot of use of the weekend. Hawthorn, another beautiful tree for the landscape that also is welcoming birds. Crabapple, black cherry and choke cherry are, are native trees. Uh, black chokeberry, uh, this one I call it an eddy medi ento ornithomental because it's edible, medicinal. Uh, it's for the insects, that's where the ento comes in, entomology, and the ornitho for the bird. So eddy medi ento ornitho. It's an edible for humans and medicinal for humans as well as being good for insects and birds. Uh, learn about these uh, these wonderful shrubs and make use of them. Um, red chokeberry as well. Blackberry, black raspberry, northern bayberry is available for birds in the middle of winter when they're hungry. Uh, and then there are the conifers that have edible seeds and provide uh, nesting and shelter. And in fact, remarkably, some uh, many caterpillars as well will be feeding on those needles and then the birds can pick them off and the fruit of the Eastern red cedar. For vines, we've got the Virginia creeper fruits, uh, grapes, wild honeysuckle, a beautiful ground cover called bearberry that thrives in the full sun, it's evergreen. And the, the seeds, of course, sunflower seeds are eagerly sought after by birds, but this is not the only wildflower or flower in the our landscape that we can provide. Uh, the wildflowers such as black-eyed Susan, and purple coneflower, you'll see the family resemblance. They, these are the aster family uh, plants that uh, have edible seeds, more seeds, and virtually all of these on this slide, again, are in the aster family, Asteraceae. They have edible seeds for birds. So if you leave your seed stalk standing over the winter, instead of doing a fall cleanup, just be patient and, and let this be a kind of a statement on your landscape. It gives the it gives your landscape a kind of a rugged beauty as well. And you're, you're helping to provide habitat for insects and food for birds. Uh, and then uh, later on uh, in mid spring, perhaps you can then go ahead and take down the dead be uh, vegetation. Uh, leave dead trees and snags as well for wildlife uh, and leave the leaves because uh, when caterpillars drop down from the canopy in the fall, they need a place to uh, spend the winter uh, and create brush piles for birds and other wildlife. Uh, they offer shelter and uh, uh, 
uh, a place to escape to, and also sometimes they can find a meal there. So two things to keep in mind. Try to reduce your lawn by at least 25%. This is what uh, environmental organizations are asking us to do. I think it's a reasonable goal and one that would serve not only wildlife, but would gi will give a lot of joy uh, and fulfillment to your life. Uh, uh, just the, the stimulation of uh, watching those plants grow, watching the wildlife come in. You'll learn so much. You'll be able to share those uh, perennials with your neighbors and friends and relatives and family members. And, and also try to, uh, because our, our contemporary vegetation is pretty much 70% non-natives, we need to at least switch those figures and have 30% uh, have, uh, natives at the max and at least 70% native vegetation uh, so that it will serve wildlife. Uh, all decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation. This is the great binding law of the Iroquois Confederation. We need to be thinking about future generations of humans, but also of, of the wildlife, of the songbirds and the plants and insects that cannot speak for themselves. There is no limit to what we can do together. S start where you are. And thank you for doing your part. Uh, I'd like to share two more slides now. These are crop circles, and you can see that the images are of birds. Uh, I heartily uh, recommend to you that you seri seriously consider that this is a form of communication that is being gifted to us by beings not from this planet, uh, because the the uh, the phenomenon is is truly magnificently complex and simply could not be accomplished. Uh, these these plants are not mechanically bent; they are actually bent somehow with a, a strange energy that happens in the middle of the night, regardless of the weather, with no sign of entry into the field. So there we have the image of the larks. Uh, and these slides, and who knows what that message is. I don't think anyone has uh, uh, translated it yet, but there we are. Uh, Songbirds of the Northeast, uh, if there are any comments or questions, uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll attempt to answer them. 